Okay, let's, let's have a look at popular ways of enhancing memory. I, you will all have come across these, and you will all probably have used them. I mean, the, the essentially, mnemonics, as they're called, are divided into acronyms, acrostics, and rhymes. NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, NASA, National Aeronautical and Space Administration, BBC, British Broadcasting Corporation. I mean, we, we know dozens and dozens of acronyms. Acronyms seem to be proliferating in the modern world like, like a plague. The problem with acronyms is if you don't know what they are, it's very actually hard to work out what they are. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, for example, there's a system, as you know, for electronic transfer of money, now used in the UK, called BACS. Uh, and if you don't know what Bax is, you, you, you think well, perhaps it's some kind of a strange credit card or... You say, so that's, that's the problem with the acronyms. If you know them, fine. But the, we do use them very widely. And they're a good memory aid because they reduce a long... Uh, something which might be rather long for short-term memory. In, they chunk it. And chunking is a good way of doing this. Um, I expect you're all familiar with this. Richard of York gave Battle in Vain, which tells us, ladies and gentlemen? The colours of the rainbow. The colours of the rainbow. In fact, that's not entirely true because indigo is not... Uh, one of the colours of the rainbow, and I think in France they only recognise six colours of the rainbow. The indigo is not actually there, but I think without the eye it might be rather difficult, different to, to do it. So perhaps that's why the eye went in. But yes, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo and a violet. Uh, medical students, as I was once, uh, use a huge number of rhymes and acronyms and all sorts of things. Uh, if you wanted to learn the 12 cranial nerves, anybody actually doing medicine here? Okay, you are, sir. Okay. Well, huh? oh, so you'll don't need to know the 12 cranial nerves. So p you've probably heard of this. I have. <laughs> 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 On all the Olympus towering top of Finn and German Bolton Hop. Well, those are the 12, 12 cranial nerves. And, and for your benefit, sir, if nobody else is, here they are. Olfactory, optic, ocular motor, trochlea, trigeminal, abducens, facial, auditory, glossopharyngeal, vagus, accessory, and hypoglossal. So again, these kind of uh, acrostics, these kind of things can be very helpful. Uh, rhymes can be very, very helpful. Uh, the Spanish Armada met its fate in 1588. Right, that tells you when the Spanish Armada... Uh, uh, again, coming back to the world of medicine, uh, they're, they're, again, medical students like these kind of things because there's an awful lot to remember in physiotherapy and in medicine as well, in dentistry, veterinary surgery. Huge amount to learn. The lingual nerve describes a curve across the hypoglossus. I've been chucked, cried Walton's duck, to the blighter's double crossness. I have to say, I cleaned that up quite considerably because <laughs> medical students have absolutely filthy minds, and it, it wasn't originally like that, but it's, it's memorable. So, if we can't use or we can use these, what can we do to improve our memory? This is really where we come to the kind of nitty gritty of today's presentations and lectures. Well, an uh, admirable fellow in, in uh, about the 13th century called John Duns Scotus. If ever you have studied theology, you will have heard of Mr. Scotus, Dr. Scotus, whatever. Uh, he was said to be the, the subtle doctor because his arguments, his philosoph philosophical arguments were absolutely superb. He proved the existence of God to his own satisfaction. And he also thought that if you wore a peaked cap like that kind of thing, it would improve your brain, it would improve your memory. And that is why, from about 13th century onwards, wizards and warlocks and witches were always shown wearing a peaked cap. That's why Harry Potter wears a peaked cap. It's to improve his brain. And that's why, if you see shots of uh, pictures of ladies in medieval courts, they are also wearing these kind of peaked caps. It's to improve their memory doesn't work, unfortunately. <laughs> At least, uh, I, mean, I don't think it works. We haven't actually researched it. If everybody would like to give me a research grant, I'd be very happy to do so, but I think you'd probably be wasting your money. So let me now talk about the impact. This is what we really, this is, this is, the, this is the kind of core of it all, the impact approach to memory enhancement which we developed in our laboratory. And it's a, a kind of an acrostic in a sense. It stands for imagery and Dominic talked a lot about imagery and how he uses imagery, and imagery is so important to you if you want to improve your memory. Imagery really is the secret. Mental preparation. I'm going to give you some techniques for, for actually preparing your mind, putting your mind to a, an attentive state. Then attention control, actually being able to control where your attention is going. And finally, training the memory. I don't mean training your memory per se, but also training each memory as you insert it into your brain. So let's have a look at imagery. Simonides of Kos is the kind of the patron saint of people who like to improve their memory. 
Sabadides, of course, was a lyric poet around about 500 BC. And he was extremely successful, both commercially and artistically. Now, the Greeks literally worshipped memory. The Greeks, they say, had a word for it, and that word was Mesemone. And Mesemone was the wife of Zeus, and she was also the, do the mother of the nine muses. And the nine muses included history, and art, and poetry, and dance, and astronomy. Uh, that was seen as, as an art. And one day, Simonides, of course, was invited to, uh, to create and present a eulogy to a man called Scopas. And Scopas was a wealthy landowner in a town called Cranon, a Greek town called Cranon. And so it was kind of a thing he did. He was a bit of a hack, actually. I mean, he, you know, he took contracts from anybody to write eulogies for them. And Scopas had won a chariot race, and he was very excited by this, and he was ho hosting this huge banquet, and hundreds of guests were going to turn up at his mansions, and they were going to have a fantastic feast. And then, uh, as a kind of after-dinner speaker, Simon Ides, of course, was going to stand up and read out this eulogy, which he did. But unfortunately, he got a bit carried away, Simon Ides, and he, he talked a lot about... Uh, Casper and Pollux, uh, who are two gods, and he, he compared rather unfavorably Scopas's victory at the chariot race with the uh, amazing feats of these two gods. And, and this didn't please his patron at all. So when the time came to pay, Scopas said, well, since you've paid so much attention to Casper and Pollux, you can actually pay you half your fee, you see? So here's half what I said I would give you. You go out and get the rest from Casper and Pollux. And this was... Well, it didn't please Simon Ides, of course, terribly much. And yeah, a short time afterwards, he was called out by a messenger who said, there, there are two people who want to see you in the outer courtyard. So he went out to see them, and the courtyard was empty. There was nobody there at all. Wow. And just as he was looking for these two mysterious visitors, there was an earthquake, and the whole building collapsed, and everybody in the building was killed. Uh, not, only were they, uh, not only were they killed, their bodies were completely crushed and deformed, and to such an extent that next day, none of their relatives could recognize them. So they said to Simon, well, you're the only survivor. Can you actually identify any of our relatives? And he, he went back into the wreckage, and he found that by recreating in his mind an image of the banquet, he was actually able to identify, because he knew all these people personally, he was able to identify everybody from where they were sitting. Uh, this is a story, I, ha I have to say, which, which is probably partly true. It was told by Cicero about 400 years later. So that's the source for that story. But nonetheless, Simonides realized that using imagery was an extremely powerful memory aid. And he created the world's first memory course on the basis of this experience. And really, every memory course you see today is based on the work done in 500 BC by Simonides of Kos. And it's to do with imagery. And imagery is very important because essentially our memories are best for those aspects of our, our sight and sound which relate to survival. You see, I mean, our primitive ancestors, a visual memory was extremely important. You had to know what berries you could eat, uh, what animals were dangerous, what parts of the forest or the jungle or the steppes were dangerous. So visual memory developed very powerfully. Um, olfactory memory, scent, memory for scent is also very, very powerful. Um, if I get a, a, a whiff of sort of stale cabbage, I'm immediately transported back to my first school. If you, a lot of people, if they smell a bit of uh, antiseptic, for example, will suddenly remember our visit to a hospital. I suppose most famously was Proust, Marcel Proust, the, the French writer who, who sipped a little uh, tea and he had a little Madeleine biscuit and he did lime tea and bingo, 12 volumes of A la recherche du temps perdu uh, emerged, deus ex machina from him as a result of this olfactory memory. Um, gustatory taste can be very, you can taste something which can evoke a very powerful memory. Um, we have touch memories. The worst areas of our brain are the areas where we are looking at things which are abstract, because these arose in our culture much more recently. So we're going to look at these, particularly at the visual context, and we're going to, I'm going to show you how to create memories, movies in your mind. It's widely used in sports. If any of you play a sport at any level, you probably have used I imagery. Uh, Ray Floyd ha has said that he, he uses visualization. Uh, it's been called going to the movies. It may be the most important part of your mental package. Uh, and similarly, uh, Rob Andrew, world's most capped fly half. Uh, before a big match, I tried to visualize myself in different situations, different parts of the field. I'll spend a long time practicing kicks from those areas of the field where we plan to attack. So he'll go through the game in his mind's eye. 
And there's a famous story uh, in the American literature of a, of a soldier who, who was uh, captured in, in Vietnam by the Vietnamese, and, and he spent five or six years in captivity, and he'd been a very good basketball player, and every day while in captivity, he would play a game in his mind. And when he was finally released and, and went to play uh, basketball again, he found his skills hadn't really diminished, although he actually, actually uh, touched the ball for five years. So practicing in your mind is very, very important.